Good afternoon all, and thank you for joining us. My name is Kyle Hepner, and I'm very pleased to be talking with four amazing landscape designers during this hour about landscapes made for the living world. Uh, before we get started though, I would like to give some special thanks to Tony Fusco and to Boston Design Week for making us part of this year's lineup of great design events. I hope you've all been taking full advantage of everything that's been on the menu for this week and a half. There is certainly plenty to choose from, uh, including things earlier today, things tonight, and so on and so on through the weekend. Uh, I will mention also that there will be some time at the end of this session for audience questions. And at that point, if you have a question for our panelists, please use the little Q&A button located at the bottom of your Zoom window. Uh, I will mention that that's not the chat button, which isn't going to function well, so make sure you use the one marked Q&A, please. Uh, I can't guarantee that we'll have time to get to every single question before the end of the hour, but we will certainly do the best we can to make that happen for you. Now, um, next, I would like to introduce the four professionals you see on your screens who have so very kindly agreed to share their knowledge and insights with us today. Now, first up, is Matthew Cunningham, who is the founding principal of Matthew Cunningham Landscape Design, which has studios located in Massachusetts and Maine. Matthew specializes in residential landscape architecture that fuses nature with high design. For two decades, he's been promoting an ecological awakening of our cities, suburbs, and rural places, and advocating for the important role native plants play in supporting resilient site ecologies that will continue to thrive in the face of climate change. Matthew's work has won dozens of awards and has been widely published in magazines across New England. He also teaches at Harvard's Graduate School of Design, helping ensure that younger generations of professionals will be equally attuned to the importance of ecological concerns in the landscape design field. Catherine Herman is the founding principal of Catherine Herman Design in New Canaan, Connecticut. Her work is particularly informed by her strong horticultural background, an intense interest in architecture, and her extensive travels around the world. Catherine is a longtime advocate and supporter of the Institute for Classical Architecture and Art, or ICAA, and serves on its board of directors. Her designs have won much recognition from the Connecticut and New York chapters of the American Society of Landscape Architects, and she is a recipient of the ICAA's Arthur Ross Award for preserving and advancing the classical tradition. Her firm's projects have been published frequently, both in the US and internationally. Keith LeBlanc is a nationally known landscape architect who has dedicated more than 40 years to landscape design. His firm, LeBlanc Jones Landscape Architecture, was established in 1997 in Boston and has gained recognition and awards from both the Boston Society of Landscape Architects and the American Society of Landscape Architects, or ASLA. Projects from his office have been honored with both pure, pure, excuse me, peer, can't talk today, peer and popular appreciation, including accolades from the Southern California chapter of the ASLA, the Institute for Classical Architecture and Art, and the James Rose Center for Landscape Architectural Research and Design. In 2011, Keith was designated a fellow of the ASLA in recognition of exceptional accomplishments over a sustained period of time. And finally, Margie Reddick has long been a leading figure in the wild landscape movement. As principal of Margie Reddick Landscape, based in White Plains, New York, she has labored to create a design language that integrates ecology and culture. Her transformation of New York's Queens Plaza has won awards for promoting a new idea of nature in the city, where, as she says, stormwater, wind, sun, and habitat merge with an urban infrastructure to create a more sustainable vision of urban life. 
Winner of the 2013 Cooper Hewitt National Design Award in Landscape Architecture, Margie has also taught at Harvard's Graduate School of Design, at Yale, Princeton, the University of Pennsylvania, Parsons School of Design, and at Schumacher College in England. In 2016, Island Press published the second edition of her book, Wild by Design, Strategies for Creating Life-Enhancing Landscapes, which is easily findable on Amazon. And finally, you have myself as moderator today. I'm a Boston-based writer, photo stylist, and editorial strategist who has been involved in design and publishing in one way or another for over three decades. I served as editor-in-chief of New England Home Magazine for 11 years, from 2008 to 2019. And most recently, I've opened a freelance consultancy to help home design brands present themselves in a compelling way and connect more effectively with the world at large. So my thanks to all four of you for joining us to chat with me today. Now, to get some things started, our topic today uh, really touches on a whole network of related ideas, ecological sensitivity, sustainability, degrees of wildness, so-called, designing for a world in the midst of climate change and so on. Uh, it's not just a matter of, uh, I guess, downplaying big areas of lush, perfectly manicured green lawns, uh, important as that might be, uh, but it's also thinking about how the landscapes we move through and live within mesh with their surroundings and have the ability to enhance or, I guess, damage the web of life if we're not careful. Um, the idea of specifically designing to mesh with nature, it seems to me, is becoming increasingly a part of the public conversation. Um, I noticed, for example, uh, about a month ago, a feature in March in the New York Times' T Magazine about uh, designer Jasper Conran's wild garden in Dorset, England. Uh, and I, I'm sure you guys and many of our audience have seen sort of things showing up in the press that really begin to talk more about the fact that landscape design isn't just something to do pretty around your house or your office building but it's really something that is contingent on a much larger ecology of which you are all part. Uh, so that's why I thought it would be a, a nice thing to put together a discussion today of what's going on in this regard here in the Northeast. So uh, first question to anybody who chooses to jump in first, uh, how important is it for a landscape or garden project to interact well with its surrounding ecosystems? And why or why not? <laughs> Should I I'll assign somebody? I'll, I'll, no, I'll, I'll jump in. I mean, you know, I think it's I think it's very important um, because I think if it's not, it won't be successful aesthetically or functionally. Um, so, you know, I think I think I think you need to pay attention, you know, when you're designing to both of those both of those things. I would agree. I I I've thought a lot over the past decade about how important it is to use native plant materials or indigenous plant materials to evoke a, an authentic sense of place. And I think that that is the basis by which we do so. Landscape architects use plant materials as one of the most important mediums for shaping experience. And uh, the native plant materials are, are part of a place. It's part of an, uh, a, an environment. It's, it's something we draw inspiration from and design to. Yeah, well, I mean, what, what in general, I know all four of you are sort of engaged in this area and have advocated for it. So what, what was there anything in particular that sparked your personal interest in the, in the subject? I, I think I've always, always been interested from, you know, and one of the reasons why I became a landscape architect, I mean, in high school, I was an avid member of the ecology club, okay? <laughs> and on the recycling committee and having <laughs> plants in the, you know. So, so, you know, from that tiny germ, uh, you know, I've always advocated for less lawn and those sorts of things. But it's, it's interesting having a longer perspective here, uh, you know, looking over a career and thinking that I don't have to try as hard to talk people about having less lawn or incorporating native plants. 
that may, maybe, you know, there are some things that are changing that are different from, you know, 10, 20 years, you know, years ago, so. Yeah, well, I wonder um, if having a meadow is now a little bit of a status symbol. Yes. <laughs> People are actually worried about what gets mowed and what doesn't, right? Go ahead, Mark. Well, can I go back to the first question though? Because there, I think that the, the, everything is so case by case. So there are instances when um, a landscape, for instance, I was working on a project in Biscayne Bay. I don't know if I sent you a couple images, but um, where it's such a small site and this is going to relate to what sparked my interest in uh, it's such a small site that there's no larger ecological anything really to oh that's actually this is what sparked my interest this is oh, actually, okay sorry the sorry oh, we're talking about okay I'll go to, um, this is actually the, the beach and I grew up in an apartment in New York City and being able to go to this place and and live there and it wasn't so much the uh, you know the wild landscape alone it was that it was our place so it was living in the landscape and so in the sort of role of humans in these wild landscapes is really important to me uh i don't see them as scenographic places to go whoops sorry sorry you got muted margie sorry sorry uh, that was Eastern, the eastern end of Long Island, um, Napeague, I don't know if those of you who know it, but it's two hours from the city, but it's so transformative. And I just think the transformative power of these places cannot be overstated, that they really change you deeply uh, because you're living, in, you're living in these landscapes. It's not just going and looking at them or visiting them. So this is actually my house out on the end of Long Island. And um, it's just really important to me to understand the back dune and understand all of the uh, geology of the place and to try to fit into it in a way, um, as opposed to the project in Biscayne Bay where uh, there isn't anything really to connect to. This is all connecting to flyways. And, but when you're, when you're dealing with a place that it actually doesn't make sense to create a little ecosystem because there's nothing to connect to um, within any reasonable distance, then I think it's just purely symbolic or metaphoric it's actually linking with a larger landscape just symbolically so um that's okay you can so okay linking to the bay biscayne bay and not to do plantings that are native because they would have no use they would really not function but to actually make you feel as if you're in the bay the sort of uh, qualitative um uh features of being in a wild landscape uh in addition to native plantings, I think is really important. No, that's a great point. Um, yeah, and so, you know, you know that interest within the field, you know, as Keith mentioned, has become broader, which is great, which is why we have an audience today. Um, and so, I guess, Historically speaking, is this something that for you guys grew out of earlier thinking within the landscape uh, community? I mean, how how much would say Charles Law Olmsted or Beatrix Ferrand or people like that have considered this? Um, you know, kind of when and how did ecological thinking become so connected with what you're doing? Can I jump in even though I just, so Beatrix Farron, if you mentioned her, you know, mm. if you if you look at her life trajectory, she and not ended, but you know, spent the last decades of her life building one of the the most important native plant um, mm. uh, gardens, you know, in uh, on Mount Desert. And her mm. horticultural library is at Berkeley and you know, she was, she, she went to work, there was no field of landscape architecture when she um, was going to school. And so she went to work for a, an engineer and learned drafting. And then she um, actually uh, it, apprenticed with uh, the head of the Arnold Arboretum. And so she huh. got all of these different disciplines really uh, embedded or um, internalized. And so if you look at her, 
you know, she was incredible. And Matthew probably knows a lot about this. She was just incredibly tuned into native plants, both in terms of ecosystems, but also in terms of the aesthetics and, you know, garden design. She was a plant collector first and foremost, right? Yeah. That, that was her ultimate passion long-term. And huh. uh, I would, you asked about, uh, it's Frederick Law Olmsted too, Kyle. Uh, uh -huh. Frederick Law Olmsted, uh, Sorry, I sometimes he, get the he, unconfused kind of thing. He he employed lens, he employed native plants in his work, but he used plants as a space making device. It was really something that a lot of the landscapes or the this the large scale projects that he worked on, either residential or um, uh, public parks, they used this plant material not as individuals necessarily, but as large massings to shape or or create an atmosphere or to create space and. I think that both Ferrand and Olmsted, their their approaches are still completely valid in today's way of practice. I think um, plants are still central to the work that landscape architects and designers do. And I think um, we'll get into this obviously during the talk, but I, I think that uh, Olmsted in particular is also guilty for introducing lots of in non-indigenous and non-native plants <laughs> that have overtaken and, and choked waterways. And so I think what we can learn from that as, as practitioners and as, as gardeners is we should know what we're planting within the, the environments that we're working within and that we need to think beyond site boundaries. It's not just thinking about a parcel map, it's thinking about a piece of land within a certain context and, and an ecosystem. That's actually a great point. Yeah, just to, I just want to throw this in, like dialing back even, you know, prior to Beatrix and Frederick Law Olmsted, you know, just thinking, Kyle, you asked us these questions in advance. So, um, yeah, I was thinking about John, John Bartram, um, who was really one of the very earliest sort of naturalists um, who traveled the United States, was also a plant collector. Um, and, you know, was really interested in obviously all the native things that, that are here in the United States. Um, but, you know, he was certainly sending things over to Europe. Um, and I think there's been a lot of trade of plant material um, going back with think people wanting things that felt um, unique or different, you know, collectible. So uh, certainly a lot of the plant material that is native here was sent over to Europe. Um, and, and vice versa, as you just touched on. That, well, and of course, Q was a huge repository for all mm -hmm. of this stuff from every and, you know. and the Arnold Arboretum. I mean, the Victorian era was a, a it was the time and place where plants were fashionable and, and collecting things beyond plants, textiles and China and uh, amazing pottery. I mean, that was that was hip. That was cool. Yeah. It still is. You know, and I, I guess the big difference, obviously, is at that point plants were just seen as these static little things that could be taken from one place to the other and plopped in. Right. And then nobody really thought about how they, what the consequences would be mm -hmm. or how they would interact or whether, you know, the idea of invasive species wasn't really so much in the air, I think at that point. Mm -hmm. um, and so obviously we're in a very different time and place. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I guess, you know, on that topic, I mean, do you find, you know, even within your own work, do these kinds of landscapes, are they easier to achieve or do they work differently in different kinds of locations or projects? You know, so when you've got, you know, urban projects that include a public component or you've got, you know, working on something for a private developer or for a company, or you're working on something for a private residence, um, you know, are there differences in how you approach things and what you can achieve in those times? Uh, I, you know, I'll comment on that. The um, in because we do a fair amount of commercial work as well. Um, you know, it was interesting, sort of that very question, working here in Boston, in the Fens, across the street from the Muddy River, which was recently restored in a complete. Um, you know, uh, natural and all native uh, planting plan. And to have this discussion with a developer 
on native plants and why they're important was, was a real topic of conversation of why, why it made sense, not only visually to connect it in the city. You know, here's this, uh, you know, an amazing resource that we have running down, you know, through Boston and to be able to connect that in, um, in an e ecology and a visual way made it, you know, completely unique from say something that's a, a little more isolated in an urban environment. Uh, made it a very valuable tool for the landscape architect to be able to sort of infuse uh, a different flavor uh, over the entire, you know, front of the project. So um, that was, you know, important. It's different, you know, a little bit in, um, you know, working in residential, whether you're on a tiny site, you know, in an urban environment or something that has more elbow room if you're working in acres. But again, this goes back to the very first question we were talking about, you know, having it fit into the environment and linking it, whether it's visual or ecologically, um, you know, is, is super important. The subtleties, you know, in, in uh, thinking about things in terms of an approach in that way, um, just because we have a concentration of projects in the greater Boston area, the subtlety of working, say, out on the Outer Cape versus Nantucket versus Maine, they are different, you know, and we can bring that uh, perspective, um, you know, you know, from the ground up, you know, when we're working with, with different clients. So, um, that, you know, it makes it, it makes it all interesting in terms of, of the difference between working in town and working in different environments, even though it's all the same palette of plant material. It's just how you, how you sort of combine them differently. Huh. Well, well, and I, go ahead. Well, I would, I would just add, Keith, that um, the difference in commercial and residential, you, you're still advocate there, or I guess the similarity, you're still advocating and educating the client and you're sculpting this landscape experience around uh, either an ecology or, or you're educating the client on what it takes to maintain mm -hmm. that piece of, of landscape architecture and, and, and garden design. And I think that there's still values that are shared between um, not just the plant materials and the plants that are used regionally, but it's, it's really, uh, I think a global um, a, a global perspective about how landscapes can be connected to their region and to their place. And, and I think that's consistent with whatever kind of landscape architecture you're practicing or whatever kind of design you're working with. Yeah, but I, I actually think one difference between public jobs and commercial jobs and residential jobs, and residential jobs are often kind of um, somehow minimized in graduate programs, you know, are you, 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 most people want to work on public jobs, but we're really in, insistent on working on residential pro projects. One, because you're, you see stuff built. Um, you can work on a public project for seven years and never see anything built. And so the actual being in the landscape, working the landscape is much more intense in residential projects. You know, it's not just work, 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 and then all of a sudden the thing gets built. But the other thing is that it actually helps you leverage the sort of more garden gardener, gardening uh, component of landscape architecture, which is to sort of see how things go. In residential projects, you don't, it's not frozen. Okay, it all has to be done. And then you can actually go back year after year, move things, uh, experiment a lot more. So I, I think they're very different in terms of uh, in that residential projects allow you actually to engage with the way plants actually work over time and with each other, the way companion plants, you know, start to flourish together. So to me, um, it would be really great if we could actually have a little more flexibility in public projects and actually more after care. You don't just do the project, you actually should have a contract to go back year after year and a budget actually to supplement, to move things around and to really do the kind of thing you can do on a residential project. Hmm. 
Yeah, how pop, do you, can, is there some way to make that happen? <laughs> it, I don't it know. Is, yes. like, I, I think policy. it is happening. I think it is happening. I, I, I'm very good friends with someone who's involved in a lot of work in the city of Somerville. And there, there's a whole discussion about native plant materials being um, a, a very strong component of any public work. And also the realities that come with maintaining those landscapes are embedded in the design and, and coordination process. And I think that this is like every other part of design and architecture and construction right now is that it's evolving. It, we're, okay. we're going through a pretty radical change right now in the way that we think about our open spaces and our, our public and private open spaces. And, and it extends also to, to um, the suburbs, right? Like the suburbs are going through a, a ecological revolution right now as well. It's yeah. exciting. It's a very exciting time to be a landscape designer. Right. Right. So, I mean, or I guess I know sometimes in the past, um, sort of local town ordinances and other regulations have gotten in the way of some kinds of landscape work. Is that becoming less of an issue now as awareness of this grows? Well, you, you know, I got a ticket, right? For, uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, I, yeah, I forgot about that story. This is a great tell story. Us, tell us more. <laughs> well, I got a ticket because I had a like a like a lawn, third of an acre of a lawn, and I just did not want to design anything. I just want to see what would happen if I just started doing mowing differently and a lot. So it became kind of like a for refor my little reforestation project. But when I was in the ugly phase, which was probably year five, I got a ticket and, and people thought the place was abandoned for a little while. But I got a ticket for growing weeds more than 10 inches tall in my front yard. Um, and I had a little vegetable garden there and I, I so I had to go to the weed judge, you know, with all the pictures <laughs> of what these plants were, and they were native plants. I had like 14 oaks that had all, after six years that had all seeded in, and um, a, a lot of native uh, ground covers. And it was it was a, a really um... whoops. So can I unmute? I mean, yes. So. Yeah. But what's weird now is that ordinances that used to be prohibitive, that didn't allow you to do things, have waned because most municipalities have kind of caught up and are doing things that are proactive. I'm finding that it's the um, natural, well, it's, it's quite often the ecologists within municipalities or towns or villages who are applying blanket regulations to things where they don't make sense. So for instance, we have a project where there's a wetland setback. And so they gave us a list of plants, but the thing is that that's so steep that by the time you get to within, you know, like 50 feet of that line, you're in upland 10 feet of loam. It's it's in the Hamptons. So it's, and the things that are on the list wouldn't grow there naturally. So it's not very nuanced. And this is true of lead. It's true of all these regulations that they're meant to as harm reduction because of people who are gonna do terrible things. But when you wanna do really good things that are a little more subtle, they often, you have to kind of dance around them. But I, I'm glad they're there because they prevent people from doing horrible things, but you just have to work with the towns to say, look, in fact, this stuff wouldn't grow here and we're gonna plant tulip trees. Right. No, that's, that's great. Well, I think, I mean, do any of you, care to share and some of these may be trade secrets for all I know but I mean do you are you have any like anecdotes or particular strategies that you tend to employ for making native sustainable and you know wildlife nourishing and attracting landscapes uh, happen within your own practice uh, I would say that mo oh. most of our projects incorporate um, to some extent native trees and native shrubs and that with that in mind though, we're not purists. We, we love just about all plants and we mix and match and combine. And I think um, as our office has grown and we're, we're thinking about or how we're evolving, we're, we're trying really hard to infuse habitat into our work, whether it be for insects, pollinators, small rodents and mammals, um, bird life. I mean, those are those are the things that I think are, we're, we're trying really hard to make sure that um, 
that animals are part of the, the, our, our place in a property. That's, it's something that we try to embrace. Agree. I would, I would say that we definitely incorporate a lot of meadows in our projects, um, you know, and for the reasons that Matthew just said, you know, does give habitat to birds and insects and, you know, small, small creatures. Um, but I think too, you know, it does cut down on, um, you know, how much the property has to be intensively maintained. Um, so there's definitely a sensitivity to that. You know, I think meadows can be really beautiful. I mean, they go through so many different stages throughout the season. You know, there's, there's something that can be really lovely about that. So that would definitely be one of our strategies. Yeah, well, Keith, I mean, I've noticed particularly you and Matthew seem very fond of using ferns as ground cover <laughs> on large stretches of territory. Part, part of that, part of that is, um, and you know, um, I, at least at least for 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 our firm, is uh, understanding the the breadth of you know how much are we taking on here in terms of the and what kind of maintenance is a, a place going to get after? Um, you could do a very delicate you know uh, inspired you know uh, planting. But you know, a, a Piet Udolf landscape over a few acres is really not in the cards for you know a, a lot of people to maintain. So um, you have to sort of be smart of where you can insert those sort of sort of moments, um, and then broad brush you know everything else. But in terms of um, understanding overall techniques and going back to sort of the answering some of the last question. Um, we've always sort of maintained that the, the, the best is, you know, go for the best design. And if there are, because a lot of times we're, we're still, I still feel like we're kind of talking people into um, a more native landscape. And, you know, uh, people do understand um, to a certain extent what they're taking on, but a lot of times they don't. And, you know, they want this, this, and this, and they don't really know um, of what kind of maintenance that uh, a garden will require. And certainly if you're sort of getting in a more remote area away from, you know, uh, and I'm thinking specifically, you know, Outer Cape and, and things like that, where the, the gardening service is not there to call, you know, and to just come and do your garden at a moment's notice to, you know, do that. So uh, what are the techniques that we use is we try to use some ground covers and things that are tougher and can maintain themselves and then try to shrink that area of garden design, you know, that's, that's maybe perhaps a little more um, nuanced. Yeah, well, actually, um, I mean, this kind of brings us back to the idea of wildness in a way. And so, I mean, uh, of all four of you, I mean, do you have particular strategies or ways of kind of working with the degree of wildness that you use in different kinds of projects in different places or how it's placed relative to your hardscape or the structures that you're working around and things like that? I mean, Margie, I know you probably have a lot to say on this, <laughs> but I'm sure everybody else does too. So, well, I, I think that um, definitely the overarching driver of a project is not necessarily going to be either the ecosystems or wildness, but that we're always operating on that level. And so it really has to do with what the concept is, what the overall driver is for the project, but generally we fit in a large component of wildness as the framework for the project within which, so I think rather than thinking of, you know, placing areas of wildness, we think of in this region, particularly if we were in England, it would be very different, but in this region, it is, the larger landscape is pretty wild uh, outside of, um, you know, like urban areas and that, uh, having a kind of a foil of the domesticated world is really important in a lot of our projects because people 
really love to be in wild areas, but they also want to feel kind of grounded and they want the sort of um, the framework and structure of a domesticated world. And so we're not purists either, like I'll use uh, non-natives as long as they're not invasive, if they're the kinds of things that people love. You know, people like I was working in Aspen, everything had to be native and people wanted their honeysuckle, you know, and it's the, not the invasive one and, and lilacs. And so yep. I think that really understanding what is also going to feel like home to people, you know? Mm -hmm. And so it's really dependent on the client and it's also dependent on the architect and it's dependent on the site. Mm -hmm. So every project is different, I think, into the, the degree of wildness, but there's always this tipping point over which things go badly. So, um, you know, if it's too wild, I think it can really feel uh, oppressive to people. So meadows, for instance, we really have to test out clients how close to the house you want the meadow to be. Because some people really want it at arm's length. They love looking out at it, but they don't want it really growing up to their windows. And then also, um, you know, just the sense of carving out living space that feels not, that feels um, architecturalized is really important, I think, in all of our work. So it's again it's kind of case by case but i think there's always that balance between order and chaos and that fine line between it that is always what we're kind of experimenting with another thing that we uh, are conscious of is is particularly when you're inserting things into a, a larger landscape um, is the actual size of the footprint of disturbed area Right. You know, you know the, the less is more, and then editing into that wildness that's surrounding, right. you know, a, a good editing job right. is as good as a new landscape. So totally agree. Uh, that's one totally of the agree. things that's a really important tool to be able to not disturb as much and change the right. whole ecology of the soil system and so forth, but also just editing, you know, and making choices uh, you know, of what's surrounding the space. To go back to what Margie, uh, Margie was saying, I mean, you know, I think that we like to think about juxtaposition and the juxtaposition between something that's, you know, kind of formal, um, you know, domesticated to use Margie's word, um, you know, against the wild. And I think that actually is a pretty, you know, that, you know, I think it's pretty exciting to have both. You know, you need that juxtaposition to appreciate both, right? Um, so, you know, love having both of those things really in a, in a landscape. Um, and, you know, maybe being able to break those down, you know, maybe it's, it is a bit more domesticated or a bit more formal around the house, but then as you move away, you know, the, the landscape starts to soften and then, you know, fade to the, to the more wild. Can I just add one thing to also to to really reinforce what Keith was saying, which is that um, we really avoid tearing up areas to make new meadow. We just do mowing plans. Just stop mowing. You will get yep. nine times out of ten an incredible meadow. You can always plug in existing meadows. But to me, I just got kind of horrified after a couple of years of burning off an entire area and then seeding it. And particularly in areas that are, are um, you know, they're actually more fertile than what some meadows would like. And so you're sort of then amending it to make it less, mm -hmm. it, it's kind of crazy. <laughs> so uh, so we just stop mowing and making, what in terms of strategies, one of the number one strategies that we use is just a mowing plan very early on to say, what is the lawn area that you need for living, you know, how, how big an area to play ball and how big for, you know, this kind of activity and to have um, the ground not be lawn, but the ground be everything else and have the lawn areas actually be programmed functioning places. Mm -hmm. well, I, I would also add to that too, that we, we think a lot about um, when we're thinking about turf or lawn there are so many alternatives that yeah. are still 
that are still usable and still functional for, for homeowners and for, for public parks and open civic space. And our office is, has be, it really embraced using clover lawns as a great alternative where the nitrogen that's produced by the clover is actually feeding the, the fescues. And so it eliminates the need for fertilization and it reduces the, the amount of mowing that's required. And so when you add all that up, it's actually a significant uh, decrease in fossil fuel consumption of mowing patterns of irrigation requirements. Right. And so all of those things like this, just to bring it back, Kyle, to, to your question that uh -huh. we're, we're looking at the domestic landscape as surrounding the domestic areas. And then as we are moving out further and further away from the house or from a, from a, a property or from a home, it's a ripple effect. It's thinking of concentric relationships and how, what is the footprint that a, a typical home or, or family needs to have within any parcel of land? And I think that is, that's something that is a big, um, it's a big profound question for everyone to think about, especially as we talk about climate change yes. and talk about uh, how all of these ecologies overlap with one another. Yeah, no, that's, that's a very great point. Um, yeah, and I, you know, one thing that occurred to me as we were talking about this is sort of, you know, the idea that, you know, native species are there and the wildness is there if we just start leaving things alone. Um, and yet, in some cases, you know, in more kind of structured environments and things like that, I know you will want to actually bring in plant material or redo what's there. I mean, is, in recent years, has there, where do you get all of these native species have are there sources that have come into being that will actually provide the kinds of plant material you need for these kinds of projects especially here in new england i suppose yes <laughs> <laughs> quick and easy any recommendations okay. well, it's hard as the contractors it's that quite often contractors are used to their uh, you know, they're, they're stable of nurseries. And so they will swap things out. For instance, you don't quite often when you're using native plants, there are certain species that you don't want cultivars because the cultivars don't have the same habitat value. And so they will just say, well, I can't find the straight, you know, oak leaf hydrangea. So I'm gonna get this one. And that one actually bumps it out of being quote native in terms of being, uh, you know, in terms of wildlife value. But um, so it's it's really choosing the right contractors who will travel a little farther, who have better sources. I don't know if everybody else has the same experience. Very, very true. I mean, I was gonna say for plugging meadows, you know, good places to go would be someplace like North Creek Nursery or New Moon Nursery. You know, they'll sell plugs, you know, a lot of native plants that could be used to plug meadows with. With native plants um, by us there's a nursery called broken arrow and they do sell a lot of native plant material as well and and here in new england um southern new england has some pretty amazing nur large nurseries there's sylvan nurseries in westport um and then there's uh bigelow nursery in central mass and um there i, I think what we're finding though is that native plants are are becoming more popular and they're being grown by more conventional nurseries and being being wholesaled to re the retail sector so you're seeing like even even here in boston you know you go to a mahoney's or you go to russell's on route 9 and, and or, or route 20 and you see more and more native plants are being offered as part of part of the commercial offerings part of the retail offerings and i think a lot of people are catching on that wow these are actually great plants and they're they're pretty awesome to add to a, a, a even a conventional domestic garden. That's cool. And to give another plug for British Columbia, um, <laughs> I, when I was there two years ago, in the supermarket parking lot, there was smoke bush, which just blew me away that that was just one of the plants that people would just pick up at the grocery store. Oh, I love that. <laughs> Beautiful stuff. <laughs> well, I think as we get a little closer to question time, I'll just kind of ask one last final official question before we get to some of the audience questions. So uh, all of you out there might want to start uh, typing in your, your thoughts if you've got things you'd like to ask these four people. Um, but looking forward a little bit, you know, how do you see this movement going into the future? And 
you know, working with the way our climate may be changing and things like that. You know, are there are there particular best practices that you would recommend for people in the field and their clients uh, for the 2020s and into the 2030s, since we're talking about that? This is a hard one, I know, sorry. Well, can I just, just to, in my practice, we're going farther and farther into gardening and farming. So it's just really interesting that in, in order to make a sustainable landscape and public projects, we actually have to build in an infrastructure of, for how people are going to maintain the landscape because nobody's just building parks anymore and you know having huge stats. So having the um, educational kind of component and the uh, stewardship that gardening and farming actually um, foster is a really important part of quote sustainable design to us right now. So public projects are starting to look much more like public gardens um, with native plants. Mm -hmm. Very cool. I, I would add too that we need to we need to think big. We we have we are facing, I think, one of the largest crises in history, human history, with climate change and with the impacts of climate change and the the value that landscape architects, horticulturalists, garden designers, nursery people, landscape professionals, the value that we bring to a project and to thinking about how to how to um, mitigate our losses and to navigate our the damage that we potentially face in our communities. It's it is it is such a humongous um, challenge, but also an incredible opportunity for the green industries to rise to. And I, I think that that's where the next decade to, or in beyond are, are really headed, that right. landscapes matter. You know, it, there are some amazing organizations here in Massachusetts that really promote um, native plant materials, such as Grow Native Massachusetts. They're, they're just an unbelievable uh, asset and amenity for so many of us who are, are total plant geeks and they're 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 hosting um they're, they're they're bringing speakers in who are are on the ground doing this kind of work and making it making a big difference and I, I think that those are things that uh education again as margie said and we've all touched on i think education is is the, one of the most essential parts of of the equation I, I don't think you can have a landscape architecture practice today and not, you know, uh, embrace, you know, all of these issues that 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 we're talking right. about. Um, I, I just don't I I don't think that you could maintain a practice and uh, you know do it the old way. Uh, because e even the laws are changing, the environmental laws mm -hmm. and conservation setbacks and so forth that we were talking about, all of that changes constantly. So um, it, you can't rest on your laurels and think, well, now we've got a plan, this is how we do it, uh, because uh, there's always something new to learn, uh, mm -hmm. new techniques, new laws, uh, new environmental regulations in terms of waterfront sites and you know all of that in terms of so um, I think it's just essential for us to sort of you know you know forge forward but I think it's something that that we all need to be aware of and it's just something that's part of our practice these days it's yeah. not an option you know right agree yeah I very much agree very. Right. I think thinking just really long term is thinking about planting trees, native trees, um, you know, so that because they take so long to mature, I mean, that's something that, you know, if it gets incorporated into projects, you know, it's there for the next generation potentially, um, you know, and it's, if we're not doing it now, they, it won't be there. So, and, and it's, it's to get back to the nursery, where do you get these things? It's the scrappy, really uh, um, resilient plants that are often hard. People are not growing so much because they're not like legacy trees. So, you know, 
alders and sassafras, the kind of things that are shorter lived, that are really resilient and that are more mm -hmm. climate change, you know, like adaptive, uh, are actually not being grown as much because the nursery industry has been operating on purely aesthetic, yep. um, um, whatever standards. And so having nurseries really focused on climate change, adaptive plants would be a huge, huge, and, and changing our aesthetic so that we're not looking for. And I think what Keith was saying is true. Very few of us are planting the big old legacy trees um, and you know getting huge mature trees. So we're really looking at things that are you know, younger and also that aren't as long lived because you just don't know. So it's, it's a, if you're going straight for scrappiness, you might end up with entire groves of just Alanthus. Well, that's a good point. You know, I, I mean, that'll happen on its own. Yeah. <laughs> if you read um, Rick Dark and all of the these, uh, you know, there are there are real um, invasive species kind of uh, challengers. You know, to who feel that you should not be removing Phragmites, that in fact they are adapting to be habitat. Um, I land this. You know, at some point, the kind of vermin like plants that can survive may be the plants that you want to plant. Yeah, and, and their their resiliency against the changing um, coastal or sea change, sea, right. sea level rise, like right. Pragmites is one of those plants that its root system is so tenacious and, and can hold its own that it might actually be a plant that's worth preserving in large patches so that it can yeah. help with um, with storm surge and preserving right. soils and um, it's fascinating. It is fascinating. And there's no, there's no clear answer. Yeah. No, and there's not one right answer. I think it's a, right. a hybrid of all, all of these discussions. I mean, every, every one of us have been part of a panel or part of a discussion that, that really looks at the pros and cons behind, like Margie, I love that you mentioned, like, why would you go and disturb an, an existing landscape just to put in something that may or may not belong there? Like, and, and Keith, you said, editing e editing is everything it's it's really part of the power right. of of making a place um be authentic and and be believable right. yeah well on that note um i hate to cut this off but i do want to get in at least two or three questions um, sure. because people have been very patient with us and we're about to run out of time uh but one uh, unfortunately anonymous attendee has come up with a question that i think is really good that we haven't touched on yet uh, and that one is, where does hardscape design fit into ecological design? Is there a way to incorporate hardscape into design that is sustainable? Anybody want to jump on that one? I, I, I'd answer it in the same way I answered the footprint of, of making uh, whatever, whether you call it a radius art around the house or whatever, whatever your landscape design is, but to, to think of that uh, as an only what's needed and uh, to make the footprint smaller, sometimes to, uh, whether it's to fit an environmental space or I mean a conservation setback and those sor sorts of things, but sometimes we do it on our own, uh, which might require more hardscape, if you wanna call it that, uh, you know, retaining walls versus just grading, you know, for half an acre. Um, you know, those are your two options. Well, sometimes, you know, the choice is to, to keep it fairly compact and then you can save more and edit, you know, in terms of th that radius away from, from the house or the structure that, that you're working. Um, so th that's, you know, just sort of the, the only what's needed in terms of, hardscape and really take a hard look at that too. You know, uh, how many people need 20 chaises around their swimming pool? You know, do you really I, need that? I agree. I think being purposeful and artistic, th there's a, a balance between those two principles. And uh, our, our office does a lot of work with reclaimed and salvaged material. And I think that that in and of itself has a reduced environmental footprint because you're not quarrying material fresh from the quarry and all the gasoline and all, all of the hands that touch that. And it also 
it contributes again to that authenticity of place. It's, it has a patina, it has a story and there's a legacy behind it. And um, I think the biggest thing though is, is Keith, you're right. It's about function. Like what is, what is the purpose of a patch of hardscape and, and making sure that it's relevant to the indoor outdoor connection and how people live or how, how um, like we, that's a whole, Kyle, that's part two. <laughs> yeah, well it is. Part actually. two of the whole, and I just thought of a, a kind of a, another question based on that one that we could also keep going on, which is, does the style of your project or the hardscape alter how and when you can incorporate native species? So like really traditional, you know, Gertrude Jekyll looking things, you know, are there really ways to do a grand floral border, you know, that are not mostly introduced species and things like that. But I guess we don't really have time for that today. <laughs> So I think um, if you look at Catherine's Instagram page, you'll see hmm. exactly uh, there's a there's a, a really amazing juxtaposition, right, Catherine? You're, you're, you're contrasting formality with living ecosystems that I, I think you do beautifully. And I think, Keith, you, you do you, you you embrace a site in its context. Just it, it's I think it all comes down to a, a, there's a style, there's an approach, there's an aesthetic, there's there's a connection to the land. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, I hate to say this, but we have a lot of questions and we have less than two minutes left. <laughs> and I don't want to impinge on the next session, which is starting at six for some folks. Uh, so my apologies to the question people. There were a lot of really good questions that I wish we could have talked about. Maybe we'll be able to do another one of these next year if we uh, are really nice to Tony Fusco and his organizers. Um, I would, uh, as Matthew was just saying, I would uh, ask all of you, if you wanna take a look at the websites of our four panelists today, you will see lots and lots of beautiful, beautiful stuff. Uh, and it's definitely worth checking out. Um, and other than that, I you know, just want to thank everybody so much for joining us this afternoon. Um, our panelists, Catherine, Matthew, Keith, and Margie have been wonderful. We could have made this a two hour session and not run out of things to say. I think that's mm -hmm. safe to say. Uh, but for those of you uh, for Boston Design Week, um, I just wanna thank you for attending, let you know that this session was recorded uh, in case there was anything that you missed and would like to get back to, or if you have any friends uh, who you think might like to see this after the fact. Um, that video will be posted, the link probably on the Boston Design Week website on the page for this uh, session, probably in about a week or so. Um, unless I'm forgetting something crucial, which I might be, and which I will apologize for. I just want to thank all of our audience. I want to thank these four professionals. We will give you a virtual round of applause. <laughs> um, and hope you'll go on to many more Boston Design Week sessions this week. But in the meantime, I will wish you a very pleasant rest of your Tuesday. And so thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thanks so much.